Good morning, everybody. My title is Western Civilization, Why Does It Matter? Why Is It Worth Fighting For? And I'd like you to shift for a moment from the regional West to the big West. In your mind, go to Google Maps, and you start in Denver, you move to the regional West, then the United States, then you zoom out more, and you're thinking about the Western world. As the American West is changing, so the Western world is changing. And it was British author Douglas Murray in his new book, War on the West, who I think sums it up perfectly. He says in these words, in recent years, it's become clear that there is a war going on, a war on the West. This is not like earlier wars, he says, where armies clash and victors are declared. It's a cultural war and it's being waged remorselessly against all the roots of the Western tradition and against everything good that the Western tradition has produced. Now, Murray uses the term culture war. You may not like that term. You may say it's accurate, but he also suggests it's much bigger than that. Some use the term moral and cultural revolution that's taking place. Some even speak about a civilizational war. And Murray helpfully reminds us that it wasn't conservatives who started this war. The truth is it was the radical left that's been attacking every institution attempting to turn the world upside down. So you might say the Western world, just like the Western United States, is at a crossroads. Is it going to be unglued or is it going to be renewed? So let's back up for a second and just say, okay, what is civilization? Civilization is simply an order, a moral, social, structural, cultural order. It's the heritage you and I receive when we're born, but it's bigger than laws and institutions and an economy. Uh, think of it as the substructure of our, of our society. Or as my wife said, it's kind of like DNA. DNA, super important, but you can't see it with the visible eye with the human eye. It's under the surface, but it shapes absolutely everything, building proteins and tissues and organs. But today, in the Western world, many want to change the DNA of our civilization and invert the order and turn it upside down. And so they say they want to undo all the oppressions of our time. And what do they include on that list? They include free markets, the family, family roles, biological sex, hierarchy of any kind, traditional morality, sexual restraint, nationalism, constitutionalism, tradition, the Judeo-Christian tradition. Well, what is Western civilization? Western civilization, why it's the foundation on which America and European cultures have been built. It was forged by three traditions. It was forged by the Jews, first of all. They were the inventors of Western culture through Abraham and Moses. They laid the moral foundations. It was forged by the Greeks and Romans who laid philosophical and legal foundations. It was forged also by the Christian church which laid theological foundations, emphasizing both faith and reason. And guess what? The Bible was its founding document. And by 893, the time of Charlemagne, they were calling it not Western civilization, but they called it by another name, Christendom. And it was after the growth of colonies that they started using the term Western civilization. Now, I know some of you are saying, well, this sounds a little bit theoretical for so early in the morning, that you might say, well, what has Western civilization ever done for me? Which reminds me of a Monty Python movie, The Life of Brian. There was this incredible scene of first century uh, terrorists, the cell of the People's Liberation Front of Judea. They were meeting together and John Cleese, he plays Reg, who asks provocatively, what have the Romans ever done for us? And the other members of the cell respond with a long list of examples of the benefit of Roman civilization. All right, all right, Red says, but apart from sanitation, medicine, education, wine, public order, irrigation, roads, fresh water systems, public health, what have the Romans ever done for us? And some of us say, what has Western civilization ever done for us? Uh, just think for a moment of the many gifts of Western civilization. You could start with monotheism, where you have a universal culture under a unifying deity and a single moral law. You can talk about the de-sacralization uh, uh, of the state. Many other civilizations said the state was God, not in the West. God was God. The state was under God. How about the rule of law, an unchanging law that everyone is subject to, including kings? 
How about the development of constitutional law and limited government? The West was the first to argue for the universal concept of the dignity of persons, bringing an end to human sacrifice and infanticide. It abolished slavery twice. Uh, add to the list respect for property and property rights, or the unprecedented political and economic freedoms that have led to amazing levels of prosperity all over the world. Or you could add to the list the worldview of, that made possible scientific inquiry and technological advance. Or how about the universal hospital system and the vast expansion of healthcare? How about extended lifespans? What about the promotion of literacy worldwide? What about the best educational system of all time? and the creation of the university itself. And what about high art and music and literature and architecture? I mean, these are just some of the blessings that have come through Western civilization. It has an exceptional record for which we should be grateful. But in this regard, hear what I'm not saying. I am not saying that the West has no flaws, sins, or blind spots. Unfortunately, there are some pretty horrific sins that have come out of the West. We're responsible for the heresy of Marxism, which has led to over a million, hundred million people being slaughtered by state policy. We're responsible for atheistic secular states, which produced Stalins and Hitlers. And I'm not saying other civilizations aren't important. We study them at Colorado Christian Univers University. I'm not saying God's love is exclusively tied to the Western world, far from it. I'm not saying that uh, we're somehow immune from the laws of God or divine judgment and that uh, if we become rebellious and decadent, we won't reap that reward. And I'm not saying we're invincible. Exceptional, yes. Invincible, no. What I am saying is, is that Western civilization has done more good for more people, not just the West, but the world, than any other in history. It is the civilization that has enlivened the world. But as you know, all is not well. I mean, on the one hand, there are troubling signs of drift, decay, and decline. Let me name a few, the, the loss of faith that we see all around us and the secularization saying we don't need the Bible anymore, we don't need Christ anymore or the Ten Commandments. We have now replacement faiths that just aren't sustaining like nihilism and materialism and secular liberalism. Uh, you could point to the loss of civic courage that we see in the younger generation and the decline of patriotism. You could look at the nation and the nations in the West not reproducing themselves. You could look at the fact that they're unable to control their borders, that they deconstruct the moral order that God made, and they want to normalize decadence, and they have embraced what Solzhenitsyn called a destructive, irresponsible freedom. Uh, these are troubling signs of drift, decay, and decline. But on the other hand, we're observing as well an assault on Western civilization. I mean, you could point to the schools, as evidence number one, my world is the universities. You think about the Western universities. 30 years ago, it was common for every university to teach a course on Western civilization. That's all gone. Not even history majors are required to study that anymore. And it came to a head in 1987 when Stanford University had a big debate about, do we have that requirement or not? And they decided no. And there were demonstrations where crowds chanted, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ has got to go. And then in the 90s, many universities followed Stanford's example, and they stopped teaching Western civilization and the classics, the Western classics. And they said the West is, is something that we're embarrassed by. And they were pushing what we call a culture of repudiation or anti-culture. And by the way, if you oppose it, why, you're a racist, a white supremacist, a Christian nationalist, or any other of the names they use. And of course, we see now corporations joining in to this same uh, activity of opposing things that uh, we have taken for granted. Bud Light, Target, the LA Dodgers, openly ridiculing the Catholic Church, the Southern Poverty Law Center publicly shaming the Moms of Liberty and ADF as a hate group because they stand for parental rights. So in our time, convictional Jews and Christians, we're becoming the new intellectual outlaws. My friends, you see there are two ways civilizations can break down. They can break down from without when they're attacked. They can break down from within. And we're seeing a clash of civilization within our civilization, where you have Western and post-Western forces or traditionalists and progressives at each other. And you have many calling for a new cultural revolution. Its agenda now has become plain, hasn't it? Remove God, destroy the family, 
promote sexual liberation, subvert free markets, expand the state, teach that Western history is nothing more than a catalog of crimes, and teach in our schools that traditional culture is the source of oppression. Yes, the family, marriage, binary gender, patriotism, free markets, constitutionalism, and of course, under it all is the comprehensive assault on Christianity itself, which many say is the source of all evils. Now, conservatives and independents and Christians are starting to wake up and say, enough of this. You're killing the goose that laid the golden egg. This is crazy. We cannot go forward. So I want to close by suggesting how we respond to this. What do we do? How do we save Western civilization? How do we turn it around and become Western strong? And the good news is that there are times in history when civilizations have renewed themselves after periods of decay. So let me give you three bare essentials for a counter-revolution. And start with this. We must speak out and contend for the truth in our generation. We must. We must. Postmodernists are committed to a total war on truth. We must contend for the truth of truth and human dignity and the order of creation. It's time to start protesting the lies that we're being compelled to embrace to protest the erroneous worldviews that do not lead to human flourishing, to protest the cultural suicide that radicals are pushing on us. In other words, we got to move beyond just conserving something. We have to overthrow something. We need a counter-revolution in our time for what is good, true, and beautiful. And by the way, if you start to speak out as you must, you will be labeled and maligned as bigots. But know that that's a radical strategy, too, because they've given up on arguments. All they can do is call you names. So we must speak out and contend for the truth. Secondly, we must have babies and uh, impart to them our heritage. Uh, you heard me right. Peter Kreeft said the single most necessary thing we can possibly do to save our civilization is to have children. If you don't have children, you, you don't have a civilization. And saving the Western civilization starts at home. It does. And I know some of you are about the age of Abraham and Sarah. And, and, I, and I could, with biblical ground, say, you can do it. But I know you have children and grandchildren. And that you can encourage them to think well of children and the high call of having children and raising them well and sticking with them. I mean, our population, we're below replacement level now. 1.6 children per family and 40% are born out of wedlock. We, we have a mess, but we look at children differently, don't we? As our arrows to influence our culture, Psalm 127. We look at the important job of having them and transmitting the best of our culture and our past and our traditions to them. Like Hannah Arendt, the historian said, in every generation, civilizations are raided by barbarians. She said, we call them children. They must be civilized before it is too late. And that's so true. Having babies, sticking with them, transmitting the values that are important to them. And then thirdly, a third bare essential for a counter-revolution is to return to the faith that brought us sanity and life to Western civilization in the first place. Go back to our spiritual roots that gave us ballast. Look, secular progressivism and philosophical materialism are not enough to sustain a civilization. And they are not enough to be a foundation for the American experiment. The founders of America knew that. And so we must return to the God of the scriptures and return to the sacred scriptures themselves, the Bible. We need a religious awakening in our culture. We need a Christian renaissance. And let me make a special appeal to pastors who are watching. Be the church and be bold with the gospel and biblical, biblical truth. Preach the word of God. Declare the word of God. You have helped pastors bring the gospel to the ends of the, of the earth, but we need to give serious attention to how to reach the West again, re-evangelizing our culture. Don't be defeatist. Don't give up and pull back. G.K. Chesterton said, at least five times the faith has to all appearances gone to the dogs. But in each of these cases, it was the dog that died. And Jesus, of course, said, I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail. 
So I close with an appeal from the Hebrew Scriptures. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 11 to 13. Judea was um, threatened when the prophets were prophesying against its immorality and idolatry. The prophet Jeremiah came up and would thunder, Thus saith the Lord, Has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now this is the word of God to, through Jeremiah to Judah, but it may equally be taken as the word of God to the once theistic Western world. We have changed the glory for that which does not profit. We have a defective reservoir that holds no water. We are running dry and God says to us again, my people have forgotten the Lord their God. Return to me, for I am the fountain of living water. Ad fontes. Come back to the fountain of life. And these are words not just for ancient Judah. They are words for a civilization that is at the crossroads. And they are the pathway to becoming Western strong. May God bless you. Thank you very much.